Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm your host, Glenn Smith. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing scams and consumer protection. In 2020, over 47% of Americans had found themselves in some form to be victims of identity theft and losses exceeding over $700 billion, which was a 42% increase from the year before. So if you or someone you know has been a victim of scams, this show's for you. But we're also going to be talking a little bit about how to protect yourself so you do not become one of those. So the losses, as far as the forecast goes for scams and consumer protection related issues, are expected to increase this year and undoubtedly every year after. So this is going to continue to be an issue. The Federal Trade Commission, which is the FTC, tracks consumer fraud and identity theft complaints and over eight, excuse me, 4.8 million identity theft and fraud report cases were made last year. Again, there's a lot of this happening. So we're very excited to welcome two guests with us here today that are gonna help talk to us a little bit about what they're seeing out there for scams and consumer protection related issues, but more importantly, what to do if you or someone you know is a victim and how to better protect yourself. So with us today, first of all, is Linda Senev. Linda, good, well, good afternoon. We always try to stay away from the afternoons and evenings because we don't know when people are going to be watching it. But nevertheless, Linda has over 30 years experience in the financial services industry and over the last 13 years as director of regulatory services with Traditions Bank. She's been responsible for the bank's compliance, bank secrecy act, security, and information security programs. She's a graduate of York College, so we always like to bring that out. And she was one of the first of the 250 people in the United States to obtain a, cert a certified regulatory compliance management designation from the American Banking Association. In her spare time, she, I'm assuming you, you have some spare time, right? Every once in a while. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. Well, she likes to spend it with her family, which is great. Also with us is Christiana Cajun. Christiana, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. Christiana is a United States Postal Inspector with the United States Postal Inspection Service in the Philadelphia Division. Mm -hmm. Over the past eight years, she's been assigned to the mail fraud team and miscellaneous team. She supports and protects the U.S. Postal Service and its, and its employees, infrastructure, and consumers. And she has investigated dangerous and illegal uses of the U.S. mail, which I suspect we're going to hear a little bit about <laughs> here today. Yes to include mail fraud, mail theft, identity theft, drugs in the mail, child exploration, excuse me, exploitation through the mail, assaults on employees, robberies of postal employees, mm -hmm. and burglary of postal facilities. Sounds like you have an awful lot on your plate. We do, yes. All right. So during her tenure, she's investigated cross-border, mass marketing, and advanced free fraud schemes, and has spoken with hundreds of victims of mail fraud schemes. Again, ladies, welcome. Thank you. So as we talked about in the beginning here, there are an awful lot of cases that are happening in this country every year when it comes to fraud and scams. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about some of the things that you're seeing out there. What should people be aware of? Well, I think it starts with the emotion and the people that are being scammed and then that plays into the type of scams that we're seeing. Um, romance scam is the first thing that comes to mind where someone meets someone on the internet um, and through that interaction the the victim eventually sends money or lose you know to the loved one or you know or is asked to send money to somebody on behalf of the loved one and next thing you know the money's gone and so is the loved one um, that's probably a big one for us we're also seeing some of the unemployment scams you know going back to the identity theft that you were talking about um, individuals who are starting to um, hear that they got their unemployment and they're like no I never got any money that sort of thing probably would be two of the bigger ones we're seeing you're probably seeing some others. So we do see a lot of the romance scams, the online relationship scams. We do see a lot of the lottery and sweepstakes yes. scams. Um, but we also are seeing a lot of the work from home scams, as well as the government impersonation scams. Well, let's talk a little bit about that more because sure. I, I, I've heard romance scams. I've, mm -hmm. I've heard 
uh, the government uh, benefits scams, but what specifically are there? One of the things you mentioned was the, the work from home mm -hmm. scam. What, what does that look like? There are a bunch of different things that can look like a work from home scam. But for instance, you might sign up online thinking that you have applied for a legitimate job and they ask you to print labels from home. They ask you perhaps to receive goods and then reship them out. Um, but it might also look like a um, secret shopper scam where you're sent a check and you're told to go to a store and use their services, send back a rating, and then forward on through Western Union or MoneyGram or some other service the funds that you have left over from your shopping trip. And unfortunately, what the victims come to find is that was a bad check that they received from their supposed employer. Yeah. And then the victim ends up being the person on the line to cover those lost costs. Yeah. yeah we're, seeing, we're seeing some of that. It, it goes hand in hand. We're seeing it with the romance scams. Mm -hmm. We're also seeing it with that where they deposit the check. And in the interim from the time the check is processed, they're told to go shopping or buy gift cards mm -hmm. um, and send them on to someone else. So, yeah, we've, we've seen a little bit of an uptick in that as well. If, if I were to receive one of these checks and having seen some of them, they, they look authentic. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do I find out whether it's a good check or not? I would actually start with your bank. Your bank is a wealth of information, and I'll probably bring that up more than once for the obvious reasons. <laughs> but in all seriousness, take it to the bank and go, this is how I got this. And it, number one, were you expecting it? That's, that's the first key here. If you were not expecting the check, chances are really good it's probably no good. Um, but if you got hooked into you know, what you think is a real job, Again, ask the bank, you know, they have, there's things that we will look at, things that we can do. I've, I, on behalf of some of our customers, we've called the bank that the check has drawn on and go, is this check good? So, you know, your bank can probably help you with some of that. And, and just take a look at it. Does it make sense? Is, you know, the check says it's from, is the name and the address correct? You know, it may say Best Western because you're going to try to do something for them, but the address is for the concrete place down the street. D does that add up? Things like that. Does it make sense? But again, your bank is going to be able to probably give you some guidance there as well. Now, one of the things that I've also heard are there's a lot of email click scams that are happening as well. If you could explain what that means. Um, that's really just a matter of getting an email that says you've won the lottery <laughs> or, you know, I've been personally the recipient of many Amazon wins. I don't shop on Amazon very often, so I find that very fascinating. But it's basically an email, probably, again, you weren't expecting that tells you you won something, you need to do something, preying on your emotions that you need to do this now or you, you'll be canceled, whatever it might be. You'll lose your car insurance if you don't click here, something like that, um, that the email came from a source that isn't really the source it says it, it is. And probably from a standpoint of did I get the right email is hovering, you know, hovering over the email address, you know, is it really... State Farm or, you know, or is it some gobbledygook.com? <laughs> and, you know, and again, we spend a lot of time with this at the bank. Does that make sense? Does that email make sense? And to follow up on what Linda had to say, no matter how you receive a solicitation, whether it's through the email, whether it's through text message, um, whether it's online, mm -hmm. or whether you receive something through the mail, it is always important to do your research to reach out to mm -hmm. the bank, like Linda said, or some other trusted person, um, whether that's a relative or a friend or even your gut. A lot of the time, oh. if you receive something mm. and something just doesn't seem right, you know, your gut's telling you that it doesn't feel right, you should probably reach out and start having a conversation. So there's a couple of things that I think were really important that I heard. Number one, common sense. Mm -hmm. If I didn't... <laughs> If I didn't put an application in for a lottery, mm -hmm. chances are I'm not going to win the lottery. That's rule number one. <laughs> Great. 
And I think also with the emails, because I received the emails and I'm sure everybody else out there is getting the exact same emails that my, my Amazon account has been frozen or my mm -hmm. PayPal account or something horrible has happened to me and I have to act now mm -hmm. by hovering my mouse over top of the email and see what the true email address is will give me some indication. That will give you some indication. But also if the logos or things of that nature mm -hmm. that are in there mm -hmm. are not directly linked to Amazon or Google or, or whomever that may mm -hmm. be, those are all significant red flags. Yeah. Some of the others too, like how is it worded? You know, that these the frosters are getting better at the English language, but there's still a couple of things that they've haven't quite gotten so does it read correctly and and always you know you know to what she, Christina said Cristiano sorry <laughs> that you know do your due diligence you know check with Amazon just don't do it through that email you just got use a di use a different source I'm sure you can go on the trusted Amazon site and you know there's numbers to call and people you know that you can contact you know verify it in another manner I mean it could be legit but and with any kind of scam, and as Linda did say, they're targeted to raise your emotion and they're really trying to get you to act without thinking too much. And so they give you some of these dire situations mm -hmm. and use some very strong language to kind of heighten your senses and make you act without thinking. So if you come into any of those situations, even though it might be hard, try to take a step back, take a breath, and really think through what you're about to do and if it actually makes sense. Great advice. Now, one of the other scams, and I've had a number of clients over the past year that have fallen prey to this, are imposter scams. Mm -hmm. So tell us about imposter scams. What, what are those and what do they look like? Go ahead. Are you, are you referring, when you call it an imposter scam, are you referring to someone shows up and says they're from the electric company? Like, I'm not exactly fair, sure where you're fair heading. Fair enough. I'll give you, a, give you a really good example. We had a client, and they received a phone call from the FBI. Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. And if, and if they didn't act promptly, mm -hmm. they were going to be arrested. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Probably right behind that, they'll also be um, need to pay their IRS bill, too, would be my guess. <laughs> um, the FBI doesn't do it that way. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that is going to be hard because you're on the phone and, and checking another source is going to be more of a challenge. But recognizing that who's calling you, that's not the way they do business. The IRS calls, you know, if you do not make your payment, you know, you're going to jail. Just like the FBI, you're going to jail. A lot of people are going to jail. Um, it's take that step back and recognize who's calling you and that's not probably the way they do business. But it's hard, it's hard and I can appreciate that. I got the IRS call and for just a second, you're like, no, Linda. <laughs> it's, it's a very scary mm -hmm. call, but to your point again, they don't do business like that. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Now, one of the other things I wanted to ask is I think there's a, a, a it's conceived or perceived out there that these scams are predominantly with the elderly. Is that, is that true? In my experience, these scams target pretty much anyone who will fall for them. And it's not specifically directed at one group or another, and it's not just one group or another that falls for the scam. But I do end up spending a lot of time doing outreach to the area agencies on aging or doing outreach to the senior populations because they are the people who have that nest egg or are perceived by the fraudsters to have that savings. So the money would be more readily available to them in the eyes of the fraudster. So that's what makes them kind of the uh, ultimate goal is to getting to some of these senior citizens and going after their retirement and savings because it is there. It's money that's already sitting and kind of waiting. So anybody could be anybody. a victim of this. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be back in just a few minutes, and we'll be continuing to talk about scams and consumer protection-related issues, but more importantly, what you can do to try to avoid being a victim.
Welcome back. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm your host, Glenn Smith, and with us today are Linda Seneff from Traditions Bank and Christiana Cajun, the U.S. Uh, Postal Inspector. And today we're talking about scams and consumer protection related fraud. So, ladies, in the first segment, we were talking about different types of fraud or scams that we're seeing out there. One of the things we didn't talk about was the loan scam. We have had a number of individuals, and it's kind of interesting because, you know, we were just talking about, you know, the elderly being scammed. This tends to be the, uh, a different group, and it's the individuals who really don't have any money, and they apply for loans online, typically not maybe verifying the source, and they get approved for the loan. And then, you know, to help facilitate the loan proceeds, they ask them for their banking login information so they can deposit the proceeds. And... The customer, unfortunately, has given it, and then the proceeds are deposited, or they'll just deposit, well, they don't deposit the proceeds, they deposit the bad check, like we were talking about earlier, and the customer believes that they've received a loan, and, you know, they can pay their bills and do whatever, and instead that check is no good, they're responsible for it, and they're out the money, and we have seen a number of situations with that, and it's very disheartening because... It's one thing to lose money, at least if maybe if you have, these people have no money. And that's, you know, now the hole is even deeper. <laughs> so, uh, again, do your homework. Mm -hmm. is, that's, that's one of the lessons. Um, how about something called an emergency scam? Sure. So an emergency scam is unfortunately something that we do see. And those are the types of scams where a victim is called and there's some kind of an emergency whether it's your grandfather has been in an accident and needs medical attention, or it's your grandson, he's been arrested, and you need to quick wire some funds from Western Union or MoneyGram, or go purchase some gift cards and send them to this place to keep him out of jail. And so that's what we see as an emergency scam. And it most of the time does roll into what we, can f we figure out as an imposter scam. And that's when the victim kind of gets double hit. They'll lose their money in an initial scam. And then a fraudster will call and pretend to be some kind of government agency or some kind of service that's going to help the victim recover their money. And they'll promise to help get the money back. But first, you need to pay an advanced fee or first you need to pay up front, you know, a percentage of the money that we're going to help you get back. So that's how we see um, an imposter scam. So those are some of the red flags to look out for. Very big red flags, yes, those advanced fee schemes. And, and generally, if somebody's asking for something to be paid with money orders or gift cards, mm -hmm. that, that should be screaming mm -hmm. at you. Why your transfers fraud. as well, yes. Yes. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about if you happen to become a victim mm -hmm. of one of these scams or one of these frauds, what should you do? Start with your bank. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, once a banker, always a banker. But seriously, start with your bank because depending on how much information you've given to the fraudsters, how much information you've put out publicly, you know, you've been compromised. And, you know, the, your bank is a very good source, you know, to help you protect the assets you still have, um, protect your accounts. Maybe we need to open new ones. Um, we have materials that we provide to our customers to help them, you know, get through this process if they have essentially their identities been compromised because of the scam and, you know, and help them through that process. And I know you have some Yes. things as well. Yes. When I speak with victims, I tell them to report early and to report often. So as soon as they start feeling like something is wrong, report it to a loved one, report it to a trusted individual. Start talking through some of the things that you've been doing, you know, in hopes of winning that lottery or sweepstakes or in hopes of making money at that new job. Because a lot of the time in speaking through some of the things that you've done, some red flags might start appearing that you didn't notice at first. And also speak with your bank. Mm -hmm. um, speak with law enforcement. Report it if you have information um, or if you even think you're getting scammed. Um, at your local level, you can report it at the state level. Um, depending on what's going on, the Postal Inspection Service, FBI, Secret Service. You never know at what level 
your case or your information is going to be helpful to try to track these fraudsters down. Now, is it I should report that if I've lost something? I've lost money, I've, I've lost what have you, or what if, well, I, I kind of got through this one, mm -hmm. no damage to me, should I still take the time to report this? I tell victims, whether they've lost funds or not, to still report the information. Report it to the bank, report it to law enforcement, but also report it to any of the entities that the fraudsters asked you to use, such as Western Union or MoneyGram, or if you went into Walmart, or if you went into any other stores um, to do some kind of transaction. Because you never know where law enforcement or which entity or who you report to will kind of be that key puzzle piece that ends up helping to put a case together against these fraudsters. And you might have a phone number that although you didn't fall for the scam, reporting that number might put something together for someone and might lead to a, a case. And it just might avoid someone else falling victim. Correct. And Correct. Back to the bank, if you think, even if you got through it, maybe speak with your bank just to make sure that you haven't put yourself in a, a position so that we can be proactive with your accounts as opposed to being reactive. It's a whole lot easier to close an account and open a new one than it is to get your money back if it's gone. Now, much of the focus is on your bank account because that's where a lot of the damage actually happens. Mm -hmm. But should your focus just be on your bank accounts? No, you're going to want to look at your credit report. You're going to want to look at, uh, you know, credit cards, any any financial information, not just your bank. I'm sure you know, if you have a broker, brokerage account, anything that has passwords, money, <laughs> you're going to want to check all of it and make sure that you've protected it, protect it adequately. You know, in case even though you think you might have made it through, make sure that you haven't inadvertently given your password to somebody and maybe nothing's happening now and it lies dormant, if you will, and then in six months you're dealing with something. So this could turn into a form of identity theft, mm -hmm. just yes. not fraud. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it probably goes without saying, although we probably need to hear it all the time, is look at your statements every month, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And also look at the information that you yourself are putting out into a public space. Um, social media yes. or dating mm -hmm. website oh. platforms for those romance scams. You know, you want to be very cognizant of what you're providing and also what you might have given in a conversation. Yeah, they're... they're they're the quick change artists of the information world. You know, we used to think about money, you know, and they're really slick in getting your money. They're just as slick, if you will, in getting your information and piecing it together. That's what they, that's what they spend their time and energy on. Social engineers. So, yep, oh. social engineering. Right, let's see how many, how many we can come up here real quick. Social media. They put out questionnaires or, or yes. things. Mm -hmm. What was your first car? Correct. Mm -hmm. what, what other things? Your favorite pet, your first pet. Mother's maiden name. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's the where were you born? Favorite color. Exactly. Yeah. Like right. Where, mm -hmm. Favorite place to vacation. Right. Family trees, lineage kinds of oh. questions. And and what type of security questions do we often have mm -hmm. with our own accounts? Those ones we just mentioned. Ah. <laughs> so maybe I shouldn't be putting that information on social media. No. Okay. No. We would we would respectfully ask you to not do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. As fun as they may be. Right. Very yeah. good, because there's an alternative uh, use, use mm -hmm. for yes. this kind of stuff. It's unfortunate, but yes. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about passwords. That's come up once or twice. Mm -hmm. General rule of thumb for passwords. The longer the better. The more complexity to it, numbers, capital letters, ca um, the characters, um, no real words probably the easiest way to think about it. Things you haven't put out there in a public space yeah. <laughs> or is easily found mm -hmm. about you? Yeah. Should I have the same password for everything? I don't recommend that either. <laughs> <laughs> about how often should I change my passwords? Yeah. I, I would, I'd like to say every 90 days would probably be a real pain, but you probably 90, 
I don't know that I have a rule of thumb for that, but I wouldn't have used 90 days. And now with technology, there are ways to find out if a password has been compromised. Um, businesses do reach out and mm -hmm. let you know um, if something has gone awry and you might need to take that extra security or prevention measure. So that has been a more talked about issue. And I think that in general, people are becoming more aware yes. of the things that they need to be doing to protect their passwords. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that I've, I've read recently and and preparing for our, our talk here today is when it comes to passwords, I need to be careful about using them on computers that aren't mine. Mm -hmm. So perhaps my office computer, perhaps the computer at the library, things of that nature, because we don't know where that information is going to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you're in a public space, never save the password. I mean, you may have to log in, I guess, for a reason, but don't save the password. All right, so I also wrote down, let's see, I think we hit some of these already, but for passwords, don't use personal information. Don't use real words. Mm -hmm. Linda, you said that one already. The longer, the better. Modify easy-to-remember phrases, because mm -hmm. that's always the challenge with this. If you have a, a series of letters, numbers, and, and symbols, and things of that nature, how am I going to remember this? Mm -hmm. But I can come up with interesting ways of using the words mm -hmm. with maybe a number one for an I, or an exclamation point, or a zero in place of an O, things mm -hmm. of that nature. Mm -hmm. Change your passwords on a regular basis. Use different passwords on different accounts, and as we said already, do not type passwords on devices or networks you do not control. Mm -hmm. All right. So I mentioned back in the beginning the Federal Trade Commission, mm -hmm. and they're in fact the ones that much of this is reported to from a fraud and, and scam standpoint. Mm -hmm. Can one get more information from the Federal Trade Commission? The Federal Trade Commission is a wealth of information, and I would highly recommend www.ftc.gov um, to go there and look to see what scams are out there, what you can do, and there's also a lot of information on what to do and how to help you if this has happened to you. Give that website one more time. www.ftc.gov. Wonderful. Well, ladies, we're getting down thank to the you. end of our show. I'd like to thank both of you again for coming on and sharing with us your experience and hopefully this will help our viewership not be susceptible to frauds <laughs> going forwards for them and also the ones that they know but if you do find yourself a victim you can contact the York County Bar Association their lawyer referral program at 717-854-8755 to speak with an attorney about it uh, or you can shoot us an email as well so again my name is Glenn Smith this has been Legal Lines and we'll see you soon